Hi everyone. Earlier this year, we released a three-part episode on the history of Shotokan Karate. So, as we've done already previously with Kyokushin and uh, Kempo, we've taken those episodes and we've compiled them together in a single release. So, we've got a lot of new viewers, so anyone who has not come across them yet can see them in one presentation. And for those who have seen it, we've added a few little tidbits of information to each one just to kind of at least bring something new. So, if you've already seen this, this these series of episodes, um, you'll find in the description below some chapter marks for a couple of new little tidbits that we're throwing in there. And I just want to extend a great big thank you to Ryan Mooney of Combat Karate. Got to represent, wear a shirt. Ryan went out of his way to help us with the production of these episodes. He took the time and effort to film original footage for us to use so we had some extra B-roll to work with. So I thank you so much for making that effort and helping us with this project. I appreciate it very much. And this uh, Shotokan compilation is actually the last compilation that we're doing for the year. We're wrapping this year up and we're hard at work in season four so we can't wait to bring you some new material. And thank you all for watching and making this channel what it is and hope you enjoy the presentation. With the first dojo established in 1936 by Gichin Funakoshi, Shotokan Karate has taken its place as one of the most prominent styles of traditional martial arts. Known for its low-rooted stances, hard kicks, powerful linear techniques, and deeply established traditions, the art has embedded itself into the very fabric of martial arts culture. The history of Shotokan is a three-part series, and in today's episode, we're going to dive into the origin of the art and ask the question, why is Shotokan the most definitive style of karate? I would like to thank some of our viewers for their help with this video. A special thanks to William Armenteros, Keith Westmoreland, and Sensei Santino Ramos for helping connect us with footage, and a special thanks to Ryan Mooney from Combat Karate for filming original footage for this series. So why is Shotokan the most definitive style of karate? Before we can answer that, we first need to talk about where Shotokan came from and how it developed into the art and influence that it has become today. And as always, I apologize ahead of time for any imperfect pronunciation as I'm not very well versed in Japanese. Funakoshi was born prematurely, weak, and in a very poor state of health. While he was attending school, he befriended the son of Anko Azato, a prominent master and teacher of Shurite. Funakoshi went on to study philosophy and even became a teaching assistant. During this time, his relationship with Anko Zato's family grew and he officially began his training in the martial arts. As quoted by Funakoshi himself, I was rather a sickly baby and frail child, accordingly. It was suggested that when I was still quite young that to overcome these handicaps, I ought to begin the study of karate. Funakoshi also befriended Anko Atosu, another prominent master and a man who introduced early karate into the elementary school system by promoting the many health and developmental benefits it had to offer. Itosu is also heavily credited with his contribution to kata. Taking traditional older styles, he reformed them and simplified them so that they could be learned by young students, and invented what is known as the Pinan Kata. Funakoshi trained under both of these men, and at various times other masters of different martial influences, giving him the seeds to many disciplines. Eventually, he learned the systems of Shorai-ru, which developed from Nahate, and Shorin-ru, that was derived from Shurite. Funakoshi found strength, passion and personal growth from his time training in the arts and was about to embark on a personal journey that would cement his legacy in karate forever. Funakoshi spent years on his training, blending the Okinawan arts and later implementing his philosophy to enrich the art and the lives of its practitioners. As chairman of a martial arts organization called the Shobukai, Funakoshi established a group of practitioners that toured around Okinawa, spreading the art and holding public performances. This gained him a lot of national attention and awareness of his teachings, and in 1916 he was given the opportunity to travel to mainland Japan for a demonstration. He was invited to perform at the Butokuden, the official center of Japanese martial arts. The event went extremely well, and his demonstration was well received. 
he was bringing a unique blend of Okinawan arts with his own teachings. He eventually attracted the attention of the Japanese Crown Prince, Prince Hirohito, and Funakoshi was invited by the Japanese Education Ministry to come back in 1922 and demonstrate his art for the first All Japan Athletic Exhibition in Tokyo. Now, according to the organization SKA, or Shotokan Karate of America, Funakoshi had intended to return to Okinawa immediately after the demonstration, but he was convinced to stay by Judo founder Jigoro Kano and Kendo authority Hakuto Nakayama. He was quoted as saying, I had planned to return to my native island immediately after the demonstration, but postponed my return when the late Jigoro Kano, president of the Kodokan Judo Hall, asked me to give a brief lecture on the art of karate. Sometime later, I was again preparing to return to Okinawa when one morning I was called upon by the painter Hoan Kosugi. So once again, I put off my departure and began giving lessons to members of a painter's group called the Tabata Poplar Club, of which Kosugi was president. Now, Hoan Kosugi would prove to be another important figure in the history of Shotokan, which we'll revisit in a few minutes. So he remained in Japan, and it appears that Kano had some additional influences on Funakoshi and the development of his art. Funakoshi officially adopted the dogi as the official karate training uniform, and he also embraced the colored belt system also established by Kano. Now, we covered this topic in great depth in how many belts are in karate, but just to quickly recap, Jigoro Kano is the one who devised and created the belt ranking system that we see in karate today. There is an old tale of ancient karatekas wearing a white belt that would get dirty and darker over time until it became black, which symbolized great time and devotion to the art. And over time, the belt would wear and shred and turn white again. Now, while this seems like a really cool and philosophical origin, it is unfortunately romanticized fiction. Belts may get dirty over time, but unless the practitioner is literally rolling around in the dirt, it would not turn black and would even fade and shred before it even got to that point. In fact, the first belt ever used in karate wasn't even white at all. It was the black belt. Kano drew his inspiration from professional Japanese swimming teams. Now, this was a big national event, and swimmers who had met a certain level of proficiency were given a black armband to wear to signify that they had reached an expert level of skill. Kano liked this idea and he decided to implement it into his teaching. So the original judo ranks were no belt or black belt. It wasn't until years later into developing judo that Kano began to add additional colors. Kano also adapted the terms Q and Don. Q ranks are numbered ranks that count down as the student progresses and eventually gets the Don rank, which is black belt. From there, the Don ranks count up as the student gets more advanced. And the terms Q and Don were borrowed from the Chinese game of Go. Oh, and fun fact. In Kano's original judo ranking system, the white belt was the second belt, not the first. So I do recommend checking out that video if you want to learn more about the, what the first belt color was and just get some cool belt history. So Funakoshi decided to adopt the belt system as well, and just like many styles of karate, the early ranks were white, brown, and then black. 8th Q through 4th Q was white, 3rd Q through 1st Q was brown, and in 1st Don and up was black. The first official karate black belts that Funakoshi awarded were in 1924, and he himself personally never promoted anybody above Godan, or 5th Don. So while his introduction of karate to Japan was well received, Funakoshi was going to have to do a lot more than just demonstrate it and adopt the judo belt system if he was wanted it to proliferate and spread. You see, Japan had a lot more restrictions than Okinawa, and karate had to be modified if it were to take hold. The first conflict was with the name. See, originally karate that was developed in Okinawa had a fair mixture of Chinese martial arts in its roots, and the Japanese kanji for karate originally translated to Chinese or Tang Hand. Now, there was a lot of political tension between Japan and China at the time, and Funakoshi feared that a nationalistic conflict of interest would be at play, so the first ideograph of the kanji was changed to mean empty instead of China. Additionally, to distinguish karate from simply a combative practice, Funakoshi promoted it as a way of life, with philosophy and meaning, and the word do, which means way, was added. Thus, we have the term karate do, or simply the way of the empty hand. Zen Buddhism was also greatly infused in Japanese culture, as it was in China, and this spirituality was considered an important part of Japanese Budo, or martial way and therefore linked and associated with Karate Do. So when it came to the katas that originated in Okinawa, many of them still had Chinese names, so Funakoshi made the attempt to change them to Japanese names as well. For example, the Pinan katas that we mentioned as created by Anko Otosu. Pinan means peaceful and safe. Funakoshi changed the translation to Heian, which also means peaceful and safe. Even with this effort, some of the original names just stuck, so there's a kind of an interesting mix of kata names, some Japanese, some Chinese. 
Now, as a result, Funakoshi now had a unique blend of Okinawan martial arts mixed with his own philosophy and modified it to fit within the Japanese cultural paradigm. He had succeeded in bringing karate to Japan, and he is often regarded to many as the father of modern or Japanese karate. And now, it was time for him to open up his own school. Gichin Funakoshi opened up his first dojo in Tokyo in 1936. Now, an interesting thing about Shotokan Karate is, Funakoshi never gave his art a name. He simply referred to it as Karate. Now, to find out where that name came from, we needed to dip back a little bit into Funakoshi's other passion, writing poetry. He was known to have spent a considerable amount of time contemplating and meditating in Mount Tarao in Okinawa, also known as Tiger Tail Mountain. He liked his time in solitude, especially on days after a long and hard training session. Now he found his refuge in the narrow pine tree covered mountain trail and he would often sit up there at night under the moon and just listen to the breeze as it gently whispered to the pine trees and that reminded him of the sound of ocean waves breaking along the shore. Now this inspired a lot of poetic imagery for him and he embraced the pen name of Shoto which in Japanese means pine waves. The word Kan in Japanese means house or hall. A lot of dojos use that term such as Judo's Kodokan. Ko translates to lecture, do, as we already established, means way, with kan meaning hall or house. So kodokan translates to the hall to study the way. So when Funakoshi students want to learn karate, they would say they were going to the shotokan, or the hall of pine waves. And over time, the name just stuck and people began to refer to his art as shotokan karate. Unfortunately, the original dojo was destroyed in 1945 in an air raid by Allied bombing during World War II, but it was later rebuilt when the war ended. Perhaps one of the most recognizable elements of Shotokan is that of the tiger patch representing many of the schools. Now we took an extensive look at this emblem in the previous episode last season, but we're going to include that segment again here because of its connection to the origin of the art. To start with, let's circle back to Funakoshi's painter friend, Hoan Kosugi. Kosugi was believed to have been instrumental in inspiring Funakoshi to spread his art, and it is said that Kosugi convinced him to write down all of his notes on the art into a master text, also known as a Tora no Maki. Now this refers to an old tradition that goes way back when a master would write down all of their notes on long scrolls, which became the master text. Now even though that tradition was already gone by Funakoshi's time, Kosugi still convinced him that this could be his Toro no Maki. He also promised to paint the cover of the book after it was finished. So Funakoshi went on to write his book, Ryukyu Karate Kenpo, and published it in 1922. Now, some references say that this might possibly be the first official book written on karate in the world, but that would be something that would need to be further verified. Kosugi kept his promise and he painted the cover of his book, which included the image of a tiger. Now, this was an interesting choice because there are no tigers in Japan. However, the tiger is often a symbol of power, strength, and ferocity. In Chinese culture, the tiger can also represent keen awareness and never sleeping. The choice of the tiger image is also very fitting in that Funakoshi spent his free time up in peace up in the Tiger Tail Mountains. And even though the name Tora no Maki means master text or master scroll, the word Tora in Japanese sometimes also means tiger. And you can often hear the text reference as the tiger scroll. So the image of the tiger fit the poetic symbolism often associated with Funakoshi. The tiger is also inside of a circle to show that it is contained. It is a power and strength that should not be used liberally, but rather with discretion and should remain contained until only it was necessary to unleash its power. The circle is also imperfect to show that it was done in one continuous stroke. Now as for the tiger itself, Kosugi didn't just simply draw a tiger, but rather he compiled a collection of lines and patterns that individually represented nothing, but when together as a whole, make up the image of the tiger. Now this also is representative of Shotokan, and honestly this can apply to the philosophy of any martial art really. The idea is that the art is not composed of just one piece or one element. It is a system of very important smaller ideas that when put together create a larger, more powerful concept. If you really look closely at the tiger's tail, you can also see part of Kosugi's signature in kanji. A lot of thought in such a simple image, and quite honestly, this has been one of my favorite martial arts emblems. And to the point where I wore it as a kid in my early training, not even realizing I was representing a different art. In April of 1957, Shotokan master Gichin Funakoshi passed away. 
His life's work had culminated to a point of creating an art that was enriched with Okinawan training, lifestyle philosophy, and it became a staple in Japanese karate. It would also be unfair to end this video without even mentioning Funakoshi's third son, Yoshitaka, or Gigo Funakoshi, who played a rather important role in the history of Shotokan. Like his father, he grew up sick and weak and was stricken with tuberculosis as a child. Now, at this time, tuberculosis was a very deadly and serious disease, and yet he was determined, just as his father was, and he also turned to the martial arts as a method to get stronger and healthier. He trained vigilantly, and he found a passion for karate, and he was known for his hard fighting style, lower stances, and the inclusion of additional basic kicks that he brought into the system. As he mastered the art, he taught at the Shotokan alongside his father and earned the nickname Waka Sensei, or Young Teacher. Gichin Funakoshi taught his art and his style during the daytime, and Gigo taught his harder version of the art in the evenings. His teachings had a great influence on the legacy of what remains in Shotokan. So Gichin Funakoshi is referred to as the father of modern karate, but I kind of like to think of them as the father and son of modern karate. So why is Shotokan the most definitive style of karate? Now I'm sure many practitioners out there right now watching would disagree with the statement, citing and crediting the establishment of karate to Okinawa, which is fair and accurate. However, Shotokan has the unique credit of taking strong Okinawan karate along with its Chinese roots, infusing it with Japanese culture, adopting the gi and belt ranking system standardized by Kano, and standardizing it further across all karate systems to the extent that many Okinawan systems picked it up, and effectively cemented its place in history as the foundation block to many other styles of karate that developed and are commonplace today. The philosophies, dojo etiquette, training techniques, and essence of most karate systems today are in some way touched by the influence of Shotokan and the teachings of Master Funakoshi. And for anyone who's interested in getting an introductory look at Shotokan, I recommend picking up the Shotokan Karate Bible by Ashley P. Martin. Now, I got this over a year ago because I just wanted a good breakdown of basic Shotokan techniques, and you're not gonna learn the whole system from this book, but this is a great starting point to get yourself familiar with the art, and you can find it in the description below. So that is part one of the history of Shotokan. In part two, we're gonna dive into the characteristics of the art itself and see how it branched off into other arts, organizations, and even the role it plays in MMA. So be sure to check back next week. So we talked about how founder Gichin Funakoshi and his son Gigo worked together to contribute to the art of Shotokan and make it what it was. And what's interesting is in that the older style of arts, many times the martial arts came from families and it's a martial arts family. So I wanna just take a moment to talk about another member of the Funakoshi family that also put his mark on the art of Shotokan. And this brings us to Kenneth Yoshinobu Funakoshi, the fourth cousin of Shotokan founder, Ginchin Funakoshi. Now, he doesn't get talked about as often as the others, but that doesn't mean his contribution was any less significant. He was born in Honolulu, Hawaii in 1938, while it was still in American territory. He got into athletics early. He began training in judo at age 10, played high school football, and was also captain of the swim team at Farrington High School. And in 1956, he began to train Kempo under Adriano Imperato, who would later go on to establish Kaju Kempo. From 1956 to 1959, Kenneth Funakoshi attended the University of Hawaii on a swimming scholarship and continued his judo training, achieving his first stand at age 17. He dual trained with Kempo until eventually he dedicated his efforts to Kempo purely and he became the youngest person to achieve a first stand in Kempo at that time. He joined the United States Air Force in 1959 at Cannon Base in Clovis, New Mexico. And while he was there, he actually taught karate to both uh, civilians and non-civilians. Seeking to continue his training, he became a student of Hirokazu Kanazawa, who was a notable fighter in the Shotokan-based JKA organization, or Japanese Karate Association. Kanazawa had been there to teach and spread the art of Shotokan in Hawaii. Kenneth Fukoshi put on his white belt, and he joined the art of Shotokan. Over the course of the next 10 years, he trained under three different Shotokan masters, and after winning the Grand Championship of the Karate Association of Hawaii five years in a row, he was appointed the organization's chief instructor. Kenneth Funakoshi has devoted his life and efforts to the art over the years. Instructor of the Year by Black Belt Magazine in 1978, and continued to rank up on the art, eventually earning his ninth don in 2001. He also established the Funakoshi Shotokan Karate Association, choosing to use the art to develop character and closely following his cousin, Gichi Funakoshi's 20 Precepts for Karate. So I think it's wonderful that other members of the founding family found their place in the art and they continue to push it forward.
Last week, we started to talk about the history of Shotokan Karate. We explored the origin and how founder Gichin Funakoshi combined his training in the Okinawan arts and then reconfigured a system that not only fit the cultural paradigm of Japan, but it also thrived as one of the most influential and definitive styles of karate in the world. So if you haven't watched that one yet, I encourage you to please do so. Today, we're going to talk about the structure of the art itself and how it set a trend of differences between different styles of karate. And we'll also look at how the art has grown and spread and even answer the question of, well, why don't we see Shotokan in the MMA? Spoiler alert, you do. And we'll talk about how as we continue with the history of Shotokan. I would like to thank some of our viewers for their help with this video. A special thanks to William Armenteros, Keith Westmoreland, and Sensei Santino Ramos for helping connect us with footage, and a special thanks to Ryan Mooney from Combat Karate for filming original footage for this series. Alright, alright. I'm sure now we have some several MMA practitioners watching right now that are saying that Shotokan is ineffective and it won't work in a real fight or in the cage. Well, we're going to come back to this after we cover some aspects because I'm willing to bet it's a little bit more relevant in the cage than it gets credit for. So why is Shotokan such a pillar in the history of karate? Well, mainly because from this point forward, Shotokan became an established foundation for several arts to come and it set many of the standards associated with karate today. Now, I highly recommend watching part one for the origin of Shotokan and how it developed by founder Gichi Funakoshi. Today, we're going to take a closer look at the art of the Shotokan itself and what it teaches. Now, upon stepping into the dojo, there is an immediate sense of culture that often comes with Shotokan. Now, Shotokan may have been derived from Okinawan arts, but make no mistake that there is a very important difference between the two cultures. Now, we're going to dive into this a little bit deeper in the next episode, but Okinawan karate traditionally is a little bit looser on formality, focuses more on teaching individuals in smaller classes, has higher stances and focuses more on upper body, does not typically take part in sport, utilizes more weapons, and treats karate as a family heritage. Shotokan and Japanese karate in general, you will find is a traditional system and many rules of etiquette are in place. There's a strong focus on technical detail and uniformity. Respect and discipline are emphasized as well as pride and presentation. Most traditional karate schools will require that a gi is clean, tidy, and intact. And some schools will even require that the uniform be pressed and ironed. Show up to a class looking proud and crisp. Most Shotokan schools will wear traditional white keys, although in modern days, and especially in the United States, you might see a variety of other colors, and the colors honestly will depend on the individual school. And the same goes with the belt ranking system. There are many different associations for Shotokan, each with different requirements. Now, while there are some arts, such as American Kenpo, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and Kyokushin, that have a fairly consistent colored belt chart, Shotokan schools seem to be a little bit more varied in belt order depending on one school or another. Also, most schools will have some sort of a patch worn over the heart on the left side of the gi jacket. In many Shotokan schools, you may see the Toro no Maki, or Tiger Emblem, worn, or some emblem derived from it. Now, this emblem is rooted in the history of the creation of the art, and it represents the philosophy and poetry of Master Funakoshi. Now, we have given karate uniforms, belts, and the Toro no Maki all their own dedicated episodes, and those links are provided in the video description below. Like many martial arts, there is a general code of conduct within the Shotokan Dojo. Bowing is commonplace and demonstrates respect, trust, and humility. You have the standing bow and the bow from the kneeling position, or seiza. Upon entering the dojo, you bow to show respect before entering the floor. Now, whether you are arriving or leaving, you face towards the front of the dojo as you bow. Now, if you arrive late and the class has already started, do not just quickly bow in and run to join the floor. Proper etiquette is to quietly bow and then kneel near the entrance until you are acknowledged by the sensei to come during class. Line up by rank, and when instructed, kneel down into Seiza. The proper kneel in the traditional Shotokan Dojo begins by placing your left knee on the floor, followed by your right knee, and then you sit back onto your feet with your toes overlapping one over the other. Hands are placed on your thigh, left on left, right on right, and they are open with fingers pointed inward. Your back should be straight and your shoulders relaxed. 
The sensei may call for meditation, and this is the moment to quiet your mind, leave your distractions outside, and prepare yourself to focus on today's class. Some schools may have you place your left hand into your right hand as you meditate. At the end of meditation, the sensei will prompt you to stop and then call out, show me Nirei, which signals for you to bow in a kneeling position towards the front of the dojo and issue respect and humility towards the institution and those in the lineage of the school. After that, the sensei may call out, sensei Nirei, which is another bow to show respect to your teacher. Repeat the motion, and with a signal from your sensei, you quickly get up to your feet and you stand at attention. This is commonplace at many traditional Shotokan schools, but of course, this may vary from one individual dojo to another. Some schools may omit or alter the bowing in sequence. And as with most martial arts styles, respect, good behavior, cooperation, and self-control are expected during class. Once class is over, many schools will close with the same sequence as the class opening. But at this point, meditation is used to reflect on what you learned today and give your mind a moment to let the experience soak in. Upon closing out, many dojos will recite what is called the dojo-kun. The dojo-kun, in literal translation, means rules of the dojo. Now, the dojo-kun is a set of principles and behavior expected from all participating karateka. Most of the time, they are printed or written and hung in front of the dojo. Now, this is yet another traditional practice that is often attributed to Kinshin Funakoshi and his philosophical contribution to the arts. You see, Funakoshi desired ethics and mental fortitude to be balanced with physical strength. Shotokan Karate wasn't only about being strong and fighting, but rather it was to serve as a way of life, to have balance in body, mind, and spirit, and to use the art for cultivation of health, and if in a dangerous situation, the preservation of life. The Dojo-kun was written as a set of five guiding principles to be practiced in Shotokan Karate. One, seek perfection of character. Two, be faithful. Three, endeavor to excel. Four, respect others. And five, refrain from violent behavior. Now, of course, you might see some variations of this due to translation, but those generally are the five principles of conduct as defined by Funakoshi. Now, being the philosopher and poet that he was, Funakoshi also established the Nijukun, or 20 rules. Now, we're going to revisit a couple of these at the end of this video, but the 20 Shotokan principles are Never forget, karate begins and ends with rei, or bowing and showing respect. There is no first strike in karate. Karate stands on the side of justice. First, understand yourself then understand others. Mentality over technique. The heart must be set free. Calamity springs from carelessness. Karate goes beyond the dojo. Karate is a lifelong pursuit. Apply the way of karate to all things. Therein lies the beauty. Karate is like boiling water. Without heat, it returns to its tepid state. Do not think of winning. Think rather of not losing. Make adjustments according to your opponent. The outcome of battle depends on how one handles emptiness and fullness. Think of hands and feet as swords. When you step beyond your own gate, you face a million enemies. Formal stances are for beginners. Later, one stands more naturally. Perform prescribed sets of techniques exactly. Actual combat is another matter. Do not forget the employment or withdrawal of power, the extension or contraction of the body, the swift or leisurely application of technique. Be constantly mindful, diligent, and resourceful in your pursuit of the way. Like many traditional karate styles, Shotokan is broken up into three main categories, Kihon, Kata, and Kumite. Now, Kihon is the Japanese word for basics. These are the fundamental concepts of the martial arts. So all punches, kicks, blocks, steps, throws, posture, movements are all part of basic training. Without strong basics, the rest of the student's training becomes compromised. See, Shotokan is very well known for its power and embodiment of strong basics. From the deeply rooted stances to snapping punches and dominant kicks, Shotokan is as sharp and crisp as karate pretty much gets. Much of this comes from the Okinawan roots that Funakoshi adopted from Shurite and Nahate prior to coming to Japan. Its signature is commanding linear driving power. Shotokan also employs the kiai and the concept of kimei to underline the basics. Kimei is a Japanese word that means to decide, and in the context of the martial arts, it means to focus all of one's energy, effort, and strength into each technique. It is full commitment to the strike without any hesitation, with the intent of ending the confrontation with a single blow. This can be applied to punches, kicks, and even blocks, which in many cases can be used as strikes in their own right. 
The key eye is the famous karate yell we all hear practitioners exclaim upon the execution of a powerful technique. The purpose of the key eye isn't just to sound badass, although if done right, it totally does, but it serves a few different functions. First, in the context of the dojo setting, a powerful key eye can set the tone of a workout, excite students, and get them more invested highlight the punctuation of a technique, and also to help learn proper breathing to deliver maximum intensity into a strike. You can inadvertently hold back a lot of power if you hold your breath, so learning how to key properly helps you establish effective times to exhale and tighten in order to inflict a margin of extra energy. Now, in a real-life confrontation, the ki still serves for power generation, but it also might potentially intimidate your opponent, or at least possibly attract attention to the situation. Kata is short for the word katachi, which means shape, form, or pattern. In Shotokan, and quite frankly in most traditional martial arts, katas are longer sequences of techniques, often simulating the combat scenario and demonstrating how movements, strikes, and defenses can be used together. Katas help with memory retention and repetition, as well as address themes in particular areas of focus. Now, many contemporary martial artists dislike and will brush off kata, which is fine because honestly people have different areas of focus. Now with that being said, there is often a lot of valuable information embedded in kata and the practice of studying deeper meaning of kata or bunkai can yield some interesting insights and philosophy to the art and relationships between techniques. The number of kata and shotokan training will vary from school to school as they construct their own curriculum. However, there are usually about 26 or 27 kata in the system created by both Funakoshi and his contributing students. Many of these kata were adopted from the Okinawan arts Funakoshi trained in, heavily drawing from the influence of former teacher and karate master Anko Otosu and his contributions to the development of kata. See, many of the kata bore Chinese names, and as Okinawa, you know, shared strong roots entwined with the Chinese arts. There was a political tension between China and Japan at the time, so just as he changed the characters of the Japanese kanji for karate to mean empty hand instead of China or tang hand, Funakoshi renamed all of the katas for his system into Japanese counterparts. Now some of them caught on, while many of them still retained their original names. For example, the Pinan katas, which Pinan means peaceful way, were five original empty hand katas from Okinawa. Funakoshi renamed them to Heian, which also means peaceful way. Now later, as the Korean art of Tang Soo was founded on the base of Shotokan, those katas, or pumse in Korean, were adopted and modified for the Tang Soo system and are known as Pyongan. So it's really interesting to see Shotokan in the middle of the chain of influence as it spread around the world. Another interesting example is the Kanku kata, originally known as Kusanku, named after a traveling Chinese martial artist whose teachings predate the early roots of karate in Okinawa. Now there are two versions of this kata, which Funakoshi renamed to Kanku, which means to look at the sky. So you've got Kanku Dai, big, and Kanku Sho, small. This kata spans across many arts, including Okinawan Shonru, Shotokan, Kyokushin, Tongsudo, and more. It is very interesting to find videos of these katas performed in these different arts and notice the similarities as they were adapted to new practices. Now, as we mentioned on how important the kiai was when practicing basics, it holds a place in Shotokan kata as well. In most kata and shotokan, there are two designated times which the practitioners unleash their kiai. It is part of the form and part of the grading and judging. It is to punctuate certain moments in the kata, as well as to demonstrate commitment and full force into the form. So go ahead and watch some shotokan katas on YouTube and watch the practitioners and you'll find that there are usually only two kiai during the entire sequence. Now as Funakoshi's influence continues, it is also rolled into the concept of embusin, or the route or line of movement a practitioner takes during the performance of a kata. Every kata has a unique flow, and therefore their own signature diagram if you were to draw it out. It designates a starting point and outlines a path of action. Now, Funakoshi's contribution to this practice was to adjust many katas so that the starting point and the ending point are roughly the same spot. Now, this has one benefit of being able to be performed in smaller spaces, in case there are many students in one room. As well, it is also helpful for the students to confirm that they have performed it correctly if they have ended up in the same place that they started. Now, many people believe that this aspect of the kata was traditional. However, it is credited to Funakoshi as it was documented in his writings and not before. And it's often not present in a lot of the earlier Okinawan arts. The concept of starting and ending at the same points have found its way into other arts, American Kempo included. So, traditional karate systems have three components, kihon, kata, and kumite. Kumite means freestyle fighting, and it is where you apply the tools of the basics along with the principles of the kata into a strategy of fighting that works for you. 
Now beginners will start off with what is called Ippon Kumite, which means one step sparring, and Gohan Kumite, which is five step sparring. Now, this is where a lot of criticism of Shotokan and traditional martial arts in general may stem from. See, one step sparring is very simple and each drill typically consists of one partner performing a single pre-planned attack and the defending partner performs a single step defense, such as a block followed by a counter strike. With five step sparring, some of the attacks and moves are repeated, but overall these are very choreographed and basic drills. Now the misconception here is that many critics of traditional martial arts look at this and will dismiss the system saying, well, that isn't realistic and these drills won't work in a real fight. I think it is really important to remember or note that this is not the complete self-defense portion of karate. These one and five step drills are meant to teach the very basic application of a single technique, demonstrating control, targeting, and getting used to working with a partner. It doesn't end with this. As students progress and become more comfortable and understand how the basics work, the drill evolves into more free attacks of one-step sparring and eventually to more advanced freestyle fighting, which may involve many varieties of speed and allowed strikes. Now, as far as actual fighting skill goes, we've said this on the channel before, but I want to stress it again, that regardless of what drills you practice or how many times you repeat a choreographed motion, unless you apply it on a regular basis with a resisting opponent, you're not going to get an accurate idea of what actually works for you or what doesn't. This means regular continuous sparring with someone trying their hardest to hit you back. Now some schools practice point sparring as well, and that is completely fine, especially if the school is a competitive school and point sparring definitely has its benefits, but I believe for proper self-defense, you need to practice with the resistance and pressure as close to a real fight as can be safely done in the classroom. And with that being said, yes, the one-step drills can work in the heat of a good sparring session. There have been many occasions that I've been trading shots with someone and I've seen the punch coming and the upper block punch combination worked brilliant or the inward block punch and I've had it done to me as well. So yes, they absolutely can work if they are applied at the right time. If you understand what it is teaching and you're able to apply it effectively in a full pressure sparring situation, then the basic drills taught in Shotokan can go a long way. So let's rewind a little bit here to our question in the beginning. Why don't we see Shotokan in the MMA? Well, we do and we see it in a couple different ways. First, there seems to be this divide between mixed martial arts and traditional martial arts. I don't like this debate primarily because mixed martial arts can be an independent mix of traditional martial arts. MMA is not a different system or way of fighting. It's just a personalized combination of arts primed for a sport competition by individual competitors that choose mixes that work for them. I think MMA is fantastic and it has the world's best fighters, but not because of what systems they use, but rather how the they choose the arts they choose and the extreme training and condition they apply in order to fight like this. MMA and traditional martial arts are not two separate entities. They are entwined and they simply address different things and I always try to bridge that gap. And with that being said, many mixed martial artists have some sort of traditional karate as part of their arsenal. And as we've explored in this series, the threads of Shotokan run through many of them. I want to use Lyoto Machida as an example, primarily because he is a high profile MMA champion, as well as one of his primary arts being Shotokan Karate. Now watching him in the stand up fighting, you can clearly see many trademarks of Shotokan and traditional Karate. First, he often takes on a little bit of a wider stance. Many MMA fighters have a more natural boxing stance, and while Machida does as well, he will sometimes drop into a lower stance, very stylistic of Shotokan. And it's from there that he delivers the devastating kicks he is known for. His front kicks and his round kicks are perfect illustrations of the power Shotokan strikes can have. And if you watch some of his fights, you see many of his opponents taking those kicks to the body and just reeling from the impact. And going back to those one step drills, if you watch closely, and there are several videos on YouTube that highlight this, but Machida does employ some of those traditional drills in addition to some basic Shotokan striking combinations. For example, an advancing triple punch combination is a very common karate kumite basic drill. Yoda Machida employs this frequently and very effectively, along with another combination of a rear leg kick advancing followed by a front hand punch. Basic steps in Kumite drills, but as you can see, Machida mixes them into his fights with great success. Another example is the calf kick intended to take the opponent off balance and combined with a reverse punch, either preceding or following the kick. Just keep watching fights closely and you'll see takedowns and other combinations play out in very similar fashion as to what you learn in the basic one step Kumite drill. The key is in learning how to perfect the technique, knowing when to apply it in freestyle, and then conditioning yourself with a resisting opponent to fine tune it and make it work. But some of you might be thinking, well, that's all well and good, but Lyoto Machida may just be one lone example. Well, not really. Remember, Shotokan is the foundation to a lot of arts that came after it. Many high profile MMA fighters have traditional arts as part of their striking regimen. For example, George St. Pierre is a third degree black belt in Kyokushin. 
Kyokushin has Shotokan and Goju Ryu at its core. Anderson Silva has a very diverse mix of martial arts, including Wing Chun, BJJ, Muay Thai, Capoeira, and Taekwondo. Taekwondo is derived from Tongsudo, which is heavily derived from Shotokan. Chuck the Dell is an 8th Don in Kajukenbo, which has traditional karate and Shotokan mixed in it, and Boss Rutin holds a flak belt in Taekwondo and the Kyokushin. And that's just the high profile guys. If you take a look at some of the lower weight divisions and lower profile fights, you'll see a ton of fighters employing traditional karate into their arsenal. So if you are asking the question, why don't I see Shotokan MMA? The answer is simply, you aren't looking for it. I also encourage you to go back and revisit the Niju-kun list and see where you can find some relevance to those 20 principles into your training. Several of them definitely hold true in MMA. For example, calamity springs for carelessness. If you are reckless and unfocused in the cage, you're going to have a bad time. Make adjustments according to your opponent. Formal stances are for beginners. Later, one stands more naturally. Preform prescribed sets of techniques exactly. Actual combat is another matter. You see, these all hold very true for competitive fighting, and I think my favorite one is, Karate is like boiling water. Without heat, it returns to its tepid state. Such a powerful and accurate statement, and it applies to all martial arts. If you stop putting passion and effort into your training, and you forget that you're always a student, it's very easy to get comfortable and complacent, and then your skill set might not have enough steam to be effective when you need it. That is just one of many important lessons that Shotokan teaches us. So if you are interested in getting an introduction to Shotokan before committing to any classes, I do recommend this book. It's the Shotokan Bible by Ashley P. Martin. It's a really good book that breaks down the basic curriculum from white belt all the way up to black belt. And while it's not going to replace a live class, it gives you a great idea of what to expect and encounter in a Shotokan class. So I wanted to highlight a little bit more about Lee Yoda Machida and how he's such a great example of how to represent Shotokan and its place in MMA. But I think the reason he makes Shotokan so effective is the incredibly dynamic background he has in the martial arts. First of all, he's well versed in the martial arts. You know, with extensive experience in Shotokan, he also trained in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai, Sumo, and Jeet Kune Do. He was trained in the art of Shotokan by his father, Yoshizo Machida, a Japanese sensei who currently holds an eighth don in the art of Shotokan. Sensei Machida fell in love with the art and he strongly believes in the character that Karate built and how it prepares practitioners to overcome life's challenges. He moved to Brazil in 1968 where he met his wife and moved there permanently and devoted himself to share his teachings in the art in Brazil. Lyoto and his brothers trained under their father, with Lyoto starting at the age of three and earning his first don in Shotokan at age 13. He traveled and continued training in multiple arts and winning several tournaments before coming to America to pursue a career in the UFC. Besides having a respectable record in MMA and the UFC, Lyoto, along with his brother Chinzo, also established the Machida Karate Academy. Chinzo also has experience as an MMA fighter, and together with Lyoto, they have taken their family's karate and modified it into their own fighting system. Their facility is located in Lomita, California and is over 20,000 square feet and they teach a wide variety of students from all ages. They also run the Machida Association with the goal to spread the Machida Karate methodology around the world through training and certification of new program instructors. Lyoto Machida and his family are wonderful role models in the martial arts and it's wonderful to see such a legacy in that they can take and show that even traditional martial arts can hold their own and have their place in modern combat paradigms. Combined from early forms of Okinawan Karate and adapted to blend into the Japanese culture, Shotokan has flourished across the world, spawning several derivative arts and even working its way up into the UFC. So how did Shotokan become the most popular and the most influential style of karate in the world? Well, we're going to answer that in today's conclusion of the history of Shotokan. I would like to thank some of our viewers for their help with this video. A special thanks to William Armenteros, Keith Westmoreland, and Sensei Santino Ramos for helping connect us with footage, and a special thanks to Ryan Mooney from Combat Karate for filming original footage for this series. Now this is part three of the history of Shotokan, and if you haven't seen parts one and two yet, I highly encourage you to check them out. 
Part one shows us the origin of the art that founder Gichin Funakoshi put together, and part two takes a closer look at the art and its standards that are still present today, even in the MMA. And you can find a link to both of those in the video description below. Okay, so what makes Shotokan the most influential style of karate in the world? In order to begin to answer that, we need to define its place in the history of karate. Traditional karate originated in Okinawa. With local fighting systems combined with Chinese influences, this led to the rise of three primary classifications of Okinawan karate, or te as it was called at the time. So we had Shurite, Nahate, and Tomarite, each named after the village it was primarily present in. Now Gichin Funakoshi had an extensive training in Shurite and Nahate in the form of Shorenru and Shoreru respectively. He combined a lot of the elements between the two systems, infused a strong sense of his philosophy, and he took it to Japan, calling it simply karate, or empty hand. And again, we went into much more detail in part one, but this is just to get us started. So Shotokan became very popular in Japan, and it spread very quickly. But before we could talk about how it grew and branched into future arts, let's take a moment and acknowledge the history and contribution of the Okinawan arts. Because to be quite honest, without them, Shotokan would not exist and would not have proliferated into the several arts that we have today. So many traditionalists will consider the Okinawan karate to be the true official type of karate, and they wouldn't be wrong. However, I think it's very important to both respect its origin while also appreciating and exploring the ways that karate has grown and evolved from there, and I believe that Shotokan has been a very powerful vehicle in that respect. So before we talk about where Shotokan has taken karate, let's observe how it differentiated from its source material. So how do Okinawan karate and Japanese karate compare? Well, I've talked to enough people who have trained in both to know that it would have to be a video in and of itself to cover this adequately. There are some big differences between them, both in philosophy and in technique. Now this is by no means a comprehensive comparison, but rather just a few ways in which they differ. In Japan, formality and honor are extremely important, and they often take a regimented approach to their cultural activities, extending to the martial arts. Now there is a strict sense of etiquette in Japanese dojos. For example, the requirement of bowing before and after class and in response to instruction from the sensei. Also in Japanese karate, priority is often placed on form, timing, and perfection of technique. Uniformity plays a big role, and in an art such as Shotokan, it is extremely efficient to teach a large academy of students at one time if everything is well regimented. It preserves the details of technique and also facilitates in the transmission of the knowledge. In contrast, Okinawan karate tends to be a little less formal, less emphasis on bowing and formality, and dojos in general tend to have smaller rosters. As a result of this, a lot of Okinawan senseis will often tailor techniques based on the individuals learning it, focusing more on the efficiency of what works for that person as opposed to a uniform solution intended for a large class. Now, this uniformity has probably contributed to how fast Shotokan spread around the world, becoming one of the most common styles of karate taught. It is streamlined, efficient, and even Funakoshi himself is said to have wanted to implement it into elementary schools as a core subject. Traditional Okinawan schools tend to be smaller, often hidden within the town, with a tendency towards individualized teachings over mass instruction. Also, generally speaking, you can see a lot of differences in stances. Japanese karate tends to focus on developing the lower body and implementing some deep stances. Now, this is often attributed to Funakoshi's son Gigo, who loved deep stances, diverse kicks, and loved to compete. This in contrast to his father, who had preferred the higher stances he had learned in the traditional Okinawan Shurite and Nahate. Now, it's pretty interesting to watch a performance of a kata that exists in both Japanese and Okinawan styles of karate. Again, generally speaking, you'll often see a greater emphasis on lower stances in Japanese kata and higher, more upper body focused movements in Okinawan kata. When it comes to martial arts weapons, you're more likely to see them in Okinawan karate. Now, this is not to say that Japanese systems don't use them, but typically they focus more on open hand techniques. And honestly, most of the traditional weapons you see associated with karate, you know, the bow staff, nunchucks, sai, the tonfa, all originated in Okinawa, and kabuto, the martial way, is a big part of Okinawan arts. So while you may see weapons in both styles, you're more likely to encounter them in the Okinawan teachings, at least historically. Another stark difference is competition. Japanese karate has far more emphasis on competition in sport than Okinawan karate does. In Okinawa, karate is embedded into a part of their lifestyle. A person doesn't merely do karate, it is part of their heritage and their family life. Now while some Okinawan schools do compete, such as Gujiru and Shitoru, which are represented in the World Karate Federation, it is far more common to see Japanese karate take part in sport fighting. 
Now with all that being said, both Okinawan and Japanese karate have a lot to offer, and it would be a very interesting topic to go down that rabbit hole in the future episode, as there are a lot more differences than what we can cover today. Sensei Jesse Enkamp from the Karate Nerd YouTube channel has an absolutely fantastic mini-series on his trip to Okinawa and experience with Okinawan Karate, and I have included those links in the description below if you are interested in checking those out. In 1930, Funakoshi officially established his organization, Dai Nihon Karate Do Kenkyukai, which was later known as the Shotokai, which basically refers to Shoto society. Now, Shoto was Funakoshi's pen name that he used when he wrote poetry, and Shoto means pine waves, referring to the sound that wind makes as it ripples through pine trees. So, with Shotokan taking root in Japan and flourishing among a wide range of students, it was only a matter of time before the art itself became a starting point for future systems. Prior to World War II, during the Japanese occupation of Korea, the Koreans had limited options regarding the martial arts. A lot of their own local ways were forbidden, and many were forced to learn Japanese arts. Shotokan was one of those primary arts being taught, so naturally it became implemented into the training of any Koreans that wanted to train in the martial arts at that time. And one of these men was the man who would go on to later found Tang Sudo. Now, another Korean national who was in Japan immediately after the end of World War II was Masoyama. He grew a love for the martial arts and he sought out the training of Shotokan and he was actually a direct student under Gigo Funakoshi, the son of founder Gichin Funakoshi. Now, this was also the time that American soldiers were based in Japan and Okinawa and they began their introduction to karate. In the 40s, karate was a very unfamiliar art in America, so many soldiers wanted to learn this new combat style. So, right away, I think we can start to see how some of the early seeds were planted. Shotokan was growing in scale and popularity, and it was in 1949 that some of Funakoshi's senior students decided to establish an association to help govern, promote, educate, and spread the teachings of Shotokan. So, led by Masatoshi Nakayama, the Japan Karate Association, or JKA, was formally established as the central authority on Shotokan. An elderly Funakoshi, aged 80 at this time, was named an honorary head of the organization. Now, we have already established that the basis of Tang Sudo was Shotokan. You see, Ki mixed in some other influences from Chinese and other martial arts to direct the path of Tang Sudo. Now, this includes Taekwondo, which is the derivative of Tang Sudo, and still has a lot of Shotokan in his lineage. So Masoyama had trained directly under Funakoshi's son Gigo in Shotokan, and then later he took up the Okinawan art of Gojiru, training under the senior student of founder Chojin Miyagi. Now, Masoyama took this material and it went into years of seclusion into the mountains for vigorous training and he came back and introduced his own art of Kyokushin Karate, an amalgam of Shotokan and Okinawan systems. Actually, in fact, Kyokushin retains two sets of kata, both from Shotokan and Goju-ru. Kyokushin has then since also branched off and spawned further derivatives such as Kudo, Enshin Karate, Ashihara Karate, and others. Wadoru and Kajukunbo have also been influenced by Shotokan in their early development. Wadaru was founded by Hironori Otsuka in 1939. Otsuka was one of the first students to receive a black belt in Shotokan Karate directly from Gichin Funakoshi, and then he went to blend in Shotokan with Okinawan Karate and Jiu Jitsu and came up with what is now known as Wadaru. There are trace elements of Shotokan and Kajukubo, a greater mixed pot of arts founded by the efforts of many martial artists, including the notable Adriano Imperato. So Shotokan has definitely cemented its place as one of the pillars of the martial arts and it's hard to ignore the influence and reach it has and it continues to have. Unfortunately, Shotokan was not immune to the affliction that most major martial arts are stricken with, politics. Now, when we announced the series, I received many messages asking me to highlight the differences between all of the different Shotokan associations. I'm going to go over a very brief summary of some of the couple top prominent ones, but a full deeper look will have to be in a future video. The topic of that scale alone is an episode in and of itself. But like most arts that have toxic politics, we start at the same trigger, the death of the founder. Gichin Funakoshi passed away in 1957 at 88 years old. He had left his mark on the history of the martial arts, but what he did not leave was a successor. It did not take long for the rifts to begin, starting with his own funeral. Funakoshi's original organization, the Shotokai, formed in 1930 and focused on the spread and education of Shotokan. They represented students from many universities to help spread the art. Now, this was the first and oldest Shotokan organization. The Japan Karate Association, or JKA, registered with the Japanese government in 1957, just prior to Funakoshi's death. They wished to represent Shotokan on a larger professional scale. 
The JKA was the only legally recognized karate association at the time. Now, there are said to have been disputes over the arrangements of Funakoshi's funeral. Supposedly, both the Shotokai and JKA asserted the right to arrange it, and the rift between organizations only continued from there. Now, as with, happens with any organization with new leadership, changes began to occur. The Shotokai was largely influenced by one of Funakoshi's senior students, Shigeru Igami. Igami had originally began training under Funakoshi's son, Gigo, but then he began to stray away from Shotokan's competitive nature. He did not believe that karate should be a sport, and he withdrew the organization from tournaments and other competitive events. Igami continued to alter the teaching of the system, focusing on looser and less explosive training methods and placing greater importance on spirituality, mental balance, and sticking closer to the Nijukun or the 20 principles established by Funakoshi, and stressing an emphasis on kata. I would like to read an excerpt from the Shotokai official website. Shotokai follows the words of Master Funakoshi, who said, Karate Do is an art for training our own minds, sports that can be practiced by people with little physical strength, an art for maintaining health, and the art of self-defense. Therefore, Karate Do is not a martial art only for people who have strong muscles and physical strength, but is an art that all people of all ages all over the world need and can practice. Shotokai follows the last instruction of Master Funakoshi. There are no contests in Karate. Be devoted to kata. Shotokai has a lesson system that focuses on practicing kata. The Shotokai often refers to itself as the system closest to the original teachings of Gichin Funakoshi. Now the JKA went a different direction. First, they asserted their position of being the only legally recognized karate organization. Led by Masatoshi Nakayama, the JKA began to make changes to the material, hardening the art and focusing on explosive power and rigorous training. Now, unlike the Shotokai, they do engage in competition, but they take it much more seriously than your typical point-based tournaments. Two different excerpts from their official website highlight this philosophy. Unlike many other karate organizations, the JKA was not created as an organization whose major purpose is holding matches and tournaments. Though it does sponsor tournaments, its major focus is the practice of karate. Its purpose is the teaching of karate as a way of life. The website also goes to say, Karate is not a sport one plays for points. In JKA Kumite, there are no weight classifications and no arbitrary point system. JKA tournaments are much stricter. At the JKA, there is only Ippon, one full point, which means you have downed your opponent and won. The basis of JKA Karate is the ability to take down your opponent, regardless of size or weight, with one blow. There is no room for incremental points in such a tradition. The difference is obvious. We teach our students how to gain mastery of themselves and overwhelm the opponent. Two pretty diverse philosophies, and unfortunately, these were not the only disagreements. Other senior students disagreed with the direction the JKA was going with the Shotokan, and the JKA splintered off into several groups, which we will have to elaborate more on in another future episode. Shotokan Karate found a strong foothold in the United States as well. Shotokan Karate of America was founded in 1959 by Tsutomu Ochima, who currently at age 89 still leads the organization and teaches to this day. Oshima was a direct student of Gichin Funakoshi himself and in 1955 came to America to continue school at the University of Southern California. Now at the school, he opened the first American Karate Club in 1957 and established the Southern California Karate Association in 1959, later being renamed to Shotokan Karate of America. The SKA is a nonprofit organization with a strong goal to lead Shotokan in the United States and reach a wide base of students, offering traditional karate under one of the original students of the system. The SKA does perform a competition in tournaments, although they stress a balance on karate as a lifestyle. They are also known for holding special training events twice a year, typically in the summer and the winter. The goal of these events is to engage in an intense training session for a short duration with large groups of practitioners. It's basically a karate camp. Kyokushin Karate is also known for their intense karate camps held twice a year. So one notable mark on the SKA is that Oshima received his fifth Dan black belt directly from Genshin Funakoshi himself. Now this was the highest rank ever given out by Funakoshi, and in the spirit of the tradition of the SKA, they retain the original ranking system used by Funakoshi and does not recognize any ranks above Godan. Now there are many, many, many more Shotokan organizations and notable practitioners worth getting into, but it would not do them any justice to just cram them in here. And I do apologize to those of you who are hoping to dig deeper into that topic. However, they would require an entire episode for themselves, and I thought it was worth doing a quick overview just to kind of set the first stone of that path. I do, of course, welcome any contributions to those of you who can expand or elaborate or want to add to the different Shotokan associations of the world. And if we get enough information, then we can do a follow-up episode in the near future. So how is Shotokan one of the most influential styles of karate in the world? 
Well, it started with one man learning the roots of Okinawan Karate, combining them into his own practice, resorting to the poet that he was and infusing his own deep philosophy and crafting a balance between the importance of physical and mental training. He knew how to adapt the system to fit different political paradigms. He adopted and established standards in ranking, etiquette, practice, and teaching that resonated across generations of future karate styles. His influence rippled back to Okinawan roots, some of which took on some of his new standards, and the threads of Shotokan can still be found today in many derivative arts and even in the UFC. So this concludes our series on the history of Shotokan. Now, Shotokan may not have been the original form of karate, but there is no doubt that Kinshin Funakoshi was a true pioneer and his legacy will be embedded in the foundation of martial arts forever. Shotokan, in my opinion, is a fascinating study. And not only is it one of the most popular and common styles of karate out there, if not the most popular and common, um, you can also trace the art back to a multiple different varieties and other styles that have stemmed from it. Now, it's not uncommon for a martial art to diverge and evolve over time, but what I find interesting about Shotokan is all the different varieties that stem from it in such a short amount of time. Ginchin Funakoshi and his son Gigo both taught the art at the dojo, but approached it very differently. Ginchin streamlined the art to fit the Japanese culture a bit and toned down a lot of the violence, focusing more on character development. We already discussed how he retained the higher stances of the Okinawan arts and took a softer approach. Gigo, on the other hand, favored a harder version of the style adopting a deeper, lower stance and developing the more competitive version of the art. The dual teaching started Shotokan on an early path to be the basis of many other martial arts. For example, Gigo implemented far more legwork and kicking into the system. Shotokan tended to be more linear and mainly utilized front kicks, but Gigo favored longer range attacks and he developed and introduced a whole array of additional kicks and legwork, which included round kicks, thrusting and snapping side kicks, back kicks, and utilizing the kicks for higher targets as well. Gigo taught higher chambers and as a result, a lot more kicks to the head. Now this is an aspect that we would see continue to progress as Shotokan became the foundation for the Korean arts of Tang Sudo and Taekwondo. Tang Sudo took the kicking even further, which helped establish dynamic kicking techniques as a trademark of the Korean martial arts, something that was emphasized even more in Taekwondo. While Shotokan often focused on linear power attacks, going for single devastating strikes and then moving out, Tang Sudo implemented more hip rotation and adding more rapid strike sequences. They often share the same kata, but with some key differences. Now, if you really want to showcase and explore the differences and the nuances between Shotokan and, and Tang Sudo katas, I highly recommend checking out our friend Sensei Ichi's channel. He did a wonderful video on taking um, a kata that he knew and learning the Shotokan version of it and performing at a tournament. So I highly recommend checking that out. You can find a link to that in the description below. Shotokan also blended a bit more as it became part of the Kyokushin system. Kyokushin founder Masoyama trained in both Gojuru and Shotokan, so his system is an interesting mix of both. The katas are retained from both systems, split into north and southern categories. Kyokushin also retains the hard linear striking movements and kicks of Shotokan, but takes it even further in a hard forward drive and devastating rapid sequences of strikes. And there's several other systems out there that have the roots and bases that are built on Shotokan. And I find it to be a really interesting study. And to even to look at Shotokan itself and see how it evolved from Shorinru and Okinawan Te, and that an art as young as Shotokan, as new as it is in the grand scheme of things, how it's been able to come together and grow and develop and become so widespread and influence so many other arts and be the basis and roots of so many other systems and varieties, I think it's really, really interesting in an academic and historical study of the martial arts. So there we go. This is the compilation episode of Shotokan Karate. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have not seen them as well, we also did the same thing for Kempo and Kyokushin. And that kind of wraps up our videos for this year. I thank you guys so much for watching us and supporting us the past couple of years. We've got a lot of work we're putting into season four. We're really excited. And hopefully we have a lot more opportunities this year. You know, knock on wood, uh, you know, social situations are a little bit better and it can open up a lot more um, opportunities. But we're excited about the upcoming year. We thank you all so much. We value your viewership. We value your support. We love our community. We hope you guys have an absolutely wonderful, safe holiday season and a very safe new year. And we will see you soon in season four. Four.